Some of you had abortions. You've had affairs. You've committed crimes. You've done some things that you shouldn't have done. You have an addiction. You have a compulsion or something like that. I want you to understand God loves you in spite of all of that, and all of those things are forgivable. And when you confess it one time, God forgives it that time. You don't have to beg. You don't have to keep begging to be forgiven. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. Hey there, it's Ashley Willis from the Naked Marriage Podcast, and this is the Exo Marriage YouTube channel where you get real marriage advice from real people. We are about to jump into part one of a teaching from Jimmy Evans, the amazing Jimmy Evans, from our 2021 Exo Marriage Conference. Jimmy is going to teach you how to love with your whole heart. Before we get to the clip, if you want to see all the teaching from our XO Marriage Conferences, be sure to visit XONow.com and join today. Now let's jump in to today's teaching and make sure you come back next week for part two. This section is called Loving With Your Whole Heart. And Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The New Living Translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The, the, our heart means the center of your being. This is, this is where everything comes from. That's why Proverbs is saying, guard this thing right here. Because every single thing in your life flows out of this thing right here. This is Jesus. It says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The word all there is the word uh, holos, where we got our word whole. Love God with your whole heart, not with part of your heart, but with your whole heart. So I want to talk about our heart being the center of how we relate to, to God and how we relate to each other. This, this is where it all comes from. So if, if you get anything right, you want to be working on, on your heart. So I want to talk about uh, four qualities that makes our heart whole to love each other with. Four different elements of our health of our heart that, that allow us to love each other properly. The first is a free heart. If we're going to be able to love each other the way that we should, our heart needs to be free. It'd be like a heart with clogged arteries where you're not really able to get the blood pumping because something's clogged there. I want to talk about the issue of forgiving ourselves. I want to talk about the issue of forgiving other people. Now, I've been a pastor for 40 years. I know in my past... The biggest issues in my past were the issue of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the mother of all issues related to freedom from your past, if you're going to be released from your past. And so the hardest person to forgive is yourself, especially when you've done dumb stuff. So when Karen and I got married, I was very immoral and I was very rebellious when I grew up. I, I didn't know the Lord. I had no conscience. I never felt bad about anything I did. Um, I, did I didn't. And when we were dating, uh, Karen's mother had a Bible study praying that we wouldn't get married uh, because I was so bad. I mean, I, was, I had a reputation, to say the least. And so they were praying that we wouldn't get married. And so um, the week before we got married, my friends threw me a bachelor party and I cheated on Karen. Okay, So um, I, I had never felt bad about anything I did. And the morning after my bachelor party, I woke up and I looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't like me anymore. And I had very high self-esteem. I had too high self-esteem. And uh, I just thought, you, you're a bad guy. And that's the day I gave my life to Jesus. And I stood in my friend's bathroom and I said, Jesus, I give you my life and I'll never turn back. And I knew that Karen wouldn't marry me. Okay? And I knew, I knew that was over with. So uh, the Lord spoke to me that minute and he said to me, never see your friends again. Because I had a bunch of friends that were not good. And I was the ringleader. And so I was the captain of our baseball team, and that day, that afternoon, uh, we had baseball practice, and so I went to baseball practice, and I took all the stuff out of my trunk of my car and laid it on the sidewalk, and they were all coming up saying, Evans, wasn't last night great? And I said, no, it wasn't. It wasn't good. And I, did, I didn't like it. And, and they, they were offended because they had thrown me the party. And, um, and, but there's more to it than that. But, so I laid everything out on the sidewalk, and, and they walked up, and I said, no. And I said, I'm not, I'm not going to live this way anymore. So I drove off from them, and I never saw them again. I mean, I saw them on, you know, walking down the street or in a restaurant, but I never saw them again. And so I went home and uh, talked to Karen uh, on the phone and told her what had happened, and she hung up on me and told me she'd never marry me. 
And but the the girlfriends, you know how girlfriends talk. So my friends' friends, girlfriends were calling Karen saying, Jimmy quit the baseball team, and he told everybody he doesn't want to live that way anymore. So she heard that I had given my life to the Lord. So after a couple of days later, we started talking, and we decided to get married. And um, but I, you know, I felt bad about that to say the least. Um, and we got married under the cloud of that just happening. And let me just say, I was I was just a bad person. I, I wasn't a good person. But I did mean it when I gave my life to the Lord. I meant it. I, I was giving my life to the Lord. Well, the devil, for the first, I don't know how many years that I was a Christian, he condemned me constantly. I constantly felt condemned. I felt condemned for cheating on Karen before we got married. I felt condemned about everything. And I grew up in a, a family atmosphere of performance. My family was, if you do good, you don't get clobbered. If you do bad, you get clobbered. There's no, there's no you know, brownie points for doing anything good. And that's the way. I, that's what I thought about God. I just thought, you know, God. God likes me when I'm doing good. When I'm not doing good, God doesn't like me. And I constantly felt condemned. And th this is a scripture that I didn't understand. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul said, I can't live for God. I can't do it. I, I try. I try to do the right thing, but I always end up doing the wrong thing. You know, I tell myself I don't want to do the wrong thing, but I always do it anyway. He said, what I realize is there's a law of death operating in my members, and I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do about it. And he ends chapter 7 by saying, Oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to save me from this body of death? Then he answers his own question. In Romans chapter 8, he mentions the Holy Spirit 12 times in 13 verses. Why is there no condemnation? Why is there no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Let me answer it for you. Because God knows we can't stop sinning. We can't stop the only thing we can do is ask the Holy Spirit to help us and he'll set us free from this body of death. Grace is about Jesus. Condemnation is about me. Satan wants to make it about me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. When I came to Jesus, I sinned. I, I sinned every day. And every, See, the devil works both sides of the sin door. He stands on one side of the sin door saying, you need to go through that door. That is an ex that, no, this door is going to make you happy. You, you need to go through that door. And he's really good at what he does. And then when you walk through the door, he's on the other side going, you are a miserable person. Look at you. Look, God can't love you. You keep saying you're not going to do that anymore, and you do it all the time. And constantly condemning us because if he can condemn us, he can keep us away from God. Okay, here's, here's the difference between me. So I got to a point where I had to forgive somebody. And it was the name, his name was Jimmy Evans. And here's what I had to say. You know, Jimmy, you've done a lot of things that you shouldn't have done. But by the blood of Jesus, they're all forgiven. And grace gives me a new future. Condemnation constantly traps me in my past. I'm going to leave my past behind. And I'm going to receive the forgiveness that comes in Jesus. And I'm not going to let the devil keep me away from the throne of grace that is mine freely. Okay, why do I say that? I have no thought, I have no thought of condemnation haven't had in many, many years. Because I'm saved by grace. It's not about my performance. When I do something bad, I talk to the Lord about it, and he forgives me. Okay, the Lord forgives me. He, he, he removes it as far as the east is from the west. Some of you had abortions. You've had affairs. You've committed crimes. You failed. You've done some things that you shouldn't have done. You have an addiction. You have a compulsion or something like that. I want you to understand God loves you in spite of all of that, and all of those things are forgivable. And when you confess it one time, God forgives it that time. You don't have to beg. You don't have to keep begging to be forgiven. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. And I want you to understand something. If you can't forgive yourself, it affects the way you relate to every other person in your life. If you can't give yourself grace, you also can't give other people grace. Because it flows from right here.
it flows from right here. And when you, when you can, let me tell you something else, it robs your joy. When you constantly feel condemned, you know, it robs your joy. But the joy of the Lord comes from the fact that it's not about me. It's not about me. If it was about me, I'd be a pile of dust right now. God could not love me if it was about me. But the reason it's not about me is it's because it's about Jesus. The devil doesn't want to talk about Jesus because the day that Jesus died on the cross was a bad day for the devil. He lost everything he had. What well, someone said to me one time, when the devil begins to condemn you, just begin to praise Jesus for his blood and the devil will shut up because he hates hearing about the blood of Jesus. Do not let the devil make it about you. It is about Jesus and his grace and you are forgiven. You are forgiven. If I'm not forgiven, I don't have a free heart and I'm not free to love other people. If, if I'm not forgiven, I don't feel like I deserve to receive the love of God. I don't deserve anything that I get from God. It's all a gift of grace. And that's why I love him so much. The other people that we have forgiven are the people around us. The people who do us wrong, the people who, you know, maybe people in our past that abused us or something. Jesus said in Matthew 18, this story now is a ridiculous story. It's about a story about a master who forgave his servant $10 million dollars. And about that servant leaving after he was forgiven, and he wouldn't forgive his fellow servant a thousand dollars, and it made the master mad, and he demanded that that servant pay back all that he owed. And here's what the Jesus says: So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you, if from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. If each of you from his heart, from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Okay, so let me talk about forgiving other people. Because a lot of people say, you know, Jimmy, I've forgiven so-and-so a million times, but my, I, I don't feel any different. I still feel bad in my heart. Um, so this is what Jesus said in Luke 6. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you, uh, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. I'm not a hater. I mean, I've never been a person that really hated, but there's been a few people that I want, I hated, you know. And I became a pastor. I was in the appliance business with my parents. Um, and I went into the ministry as a marriage and pre-marriage counselor from business. Uh, and 10 months later, the pastor left. And at 29 years old, I became the senior pastor of a thousand-member church. Okay. And so and then the Lord had called me to preach when I was 19, so I knew that someday I would come into the ministry. I just didn't know it would be like that. So I came into the ministry. I'm 29 years old. I've, I've never done a wedding. I've never done a funeral. I've, I've, I've preached maybe twice before in my life. I've got this staff. I've got this big church. And most of the people were very nice and supportive. One guy was not. And he, he decided on his own that I wasn't supposed to be the pastor, and he did everything he could to run me off. And to, and to ruin me as a pastor. Well, I, I was fearful. I was, you know, very fearful of failing, fearful of rejection, fearful of filling the blank. And I just hated his guts. And uh, he would sit out in the middle of the congregation while I was preaching and fall asleep. Like this. Just, and, and wake up and look at his watch, you know. And I just thought, Jesus, remember Ananias and Sapphira? We're just one funeral away from revival, Lord. We're just, kill him. I just wanted to see his obituary. I just kill him. I had a little dungeon down in my heart where I drug him down all day and beat him up. I beat him up all day down there. And uh, I just hated his guts. And he wouldn't go away. I just kept praying he'd go away. So one day Karen said to me, your personality is changing. Because I began to snap at Karen and the kids. Because it doesn't matter who you're mad at, the people around you get the worst of it. You can be mad at a parent who's been dead for 20 years. The people around you get the worst of it. So my family was getting the venom that I felt from this guy. And Karen said, you need to, you need to deal with this, Jimmy. And uh, so I was praying one morning. And, I, and my, I'm just being honest. I, just, I was just praying God would kill him. I just thought, Lord, <laughs> do that servant a favor. And so the Lord said, I want you to bless him. And I said, no. No, because if I did bless him and you oh, listened to it and blessed him, now I'm mad at you. <laughs> You're just increasing the problem here, Lord. Lord said, I want you to bless him every day and I want you to pray for him what you pray for yourself. And I, no, 
So I prayed like this, Lord. <laughs> I didn't mean a word of it. Ah, oh, bless him, bless him, kill him, bless him. <laughs> bless his funeral. So, so I prayed the first day, and the Lord said, every day, every day you pray for him and his family the way you pray for yourself. So, didn't mean it. So the next day, just out of obedience, I prayed for him again, you know, and I'd pray for him the next day, and prayed for him the next day. So about after about a week or ten days, I was praying for him one morning, and I had a vision. And this was just something in my heart. And I saw a boy in a field, uh, like a, maybe a ten-year-old boy standing in a field by himself. And what I knew was something really horrible had happened to that young boy. And then I realized it was the man I hated as a boy. And here's what the Lord said to me. Jimmy, you see that man for what he's done to you. I see him for what was done to him. And at that moment, the bitterness in my heart turned to compassion. You know, you know how you hear a person's name and your blood pressure goes up? <laughs> my blood pressure never went up again. And he, and he was still in the church for a while. And uh, I just looked at him completely different. You will not be able to hate a person for long that you're blessing. And blessing them is proof to God that you're forgiving from your heart. And if you cannot bless them, it's proof that you will not forgive them. Blessing is the medicine. You can say you forgive a person a hundred times. Jesus said you pray for those who curse you and who spitefully use you. That wasn't just trite spiritual advice. It's how our hearts get healed, and it's how we forgive from our hearts. So I'm saying to you this, okay? If there's someone, your parents, an ex-spouse, an ex-business partner, you know, whatever it might be, if there's someone that you haven't forgiven, forgiven, your heart's not free. You're not free. And, and what Jesus says here, the, the master said, turn that man over to the tormentors until he pays back every nickel. And Jesus said, my father's going to do that to each of you if from your heart you don't forgive your brother your trespasses. Unforgiveness is torment. Mentally, emotionally, it is torment. And we will never be free in our hearts until we learn to forgive. We need to forgive ourselves and give ourselves grace because God does. For any sin that we've committed, no condemnation of those who are in Christ. And God will only give us as much grace as we give away. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's the only part of the prayer he repeated at the end when he was explaining how to pray. And so God will give us as much grace as we give away. So when our hearts are free and we're forgiving ourselves and others, we have a free flow of the grace of God that we relate to each other through. Our heart is whole. And we're able to relate through that. And there's one other thing. I've got two 21-day journeys. I've got 21-day inner healing journey, 21-day total freedom journey. If you have issues in your life of, that you need freedom from, you can go on XO now. It's $9 a month. And you can go through both of those 21-day uh, journeys for $9 like that if you just do it in one month. And so uh, they're great resources. They're $27 on their own. But on XO now, they're just $9. And so I would encourage you if you have some issues to do that. The second thing is a full heart. Love each other through a full heart. Um, let me make a couple of comments here. We don't have the ability to love. Uh, love is not something that is resident within human beings. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the fruit of the Spirit. In and of ourselves, we just don't have the ability to love. It's not something that, that we can do. And so... If we're going to be able to love each other from a full heart, we have to begin by understanding only by the fruit of the Spirit do we have the ability to love our spouse the way that we should. So Karen and I, we went through the hard time in our marriage, and, um, and I did not love Karen properly. And uh, when the Holy Spirit began to change me and began to teach me, I asked the Lord, teach me how to be a husband. And the Lord began to teach me how to be a husband. This is one of the things he taught me. But I want you to listen to this verse. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of life. Avoid all per perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. The writer of Proverbs here is saying, 
Be careful with your heart. Be careful with your mouth. Listen to what Jesus said. Either make the tree good, talking about our heart, and its fruit good, talking about our words, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Fruit of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And what, God, what Jesus is saying here is there is a direct connection between your heart and your mouth. That's the same thing Proverbs 4 said. Guard your heart, guard your mouth. Here. So you know your heart from your mouth. Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Well, when Karen and I had a bad marriage, I had a bad mouth. I mean, I killed Karen with my mouth. I killed, I killed our marriage with my mouth. By the way, Proverbs 18 says, the power of life and death is in your tongue. And the one who respects that can get the reward from it. The next verse says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So I literally killed my wife with my mouth before I learned to ask the Holy Spirit to give me the fruit of the Spirit to love Karen with. Now, when I wake up in the morning, here's the prayer I pray. Lord, I pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit so I'll have the ability to love Karen today. I don't have the ability to love. Love is not in human beings. If you believe it is, look at the world today. That is, that is people operating devoid of the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit is God's love. God's joy, God's peace, God's patience. Did you know that he'll give it to you for free every single day and you can experience that type of love between each other if you'll admit that you're empty and you need God to fill you up? It's free every day. It's absolutely free. And you go to God and say, God, I need you to fill me up. Listen, so how do you know you're full? Your mouth. Your mouth tells you what's in here. And if God is filling you up, if you're full of love and joy and peace and patience and all that, it's going to come out of your mouth. So Karen and I, the night that I repented to Karen and I told her I was going to hang up my golf clubs, she said, your mouth is what's damaged me the most. And so I've always been growing up, I was articulate because God had called me to preach. So I've always been very articulate. When I was growing up, I was a very articulate cusser. Uh, you didn't, you didn't want to be on the other side of this thing because, I mean, I knew how to slice and dice you. Okay. Now, when Karen and I got married, I stopped cussing, but I still had a real mean mouth, and I destroyed her with it. But this mouth killed Karen, and this mouth brought her back to life. And whenever I repented to Karen, I woke up the next morning, and I began to pray the prayer, Holy Spirit, fill me up with your fruits and help me to love Karen. And this changed. And I began to talk nice to Karen. I didn't beat her down anymore. I didn't talk down to her anymore. And I began to love her. I began to affirm her. I began to praise and compliment her. And what happened was she just came back to life. And our marriage just came back to life. And here's what I'm saying. It's a very simple point. You absolutely cannot try to love your spouse out of your own soul. You don't have the ability. It's the Holy Spirit in us that fills our hearts and gives us the ability to love the way Jesus would. It's a supernatural type of love that transcends humanity. And if he's truly filling you, this thing changes right here. Let me say one other thing, I'll go to the next point, and that is watch this thing right here. It's the most powerful part of your being, your mouth. The power of life and death is in this mouth. And so we live in a very smart alecky, vulgar, vulgar culture, and a very brutal, don't we, verbally? And you watch TV and you see the way people talk to each other. Listen, that's on TV. That doesn't work in real life. In real life, every word we say is critical to each other. Thank you all so much for watching this clip of Jimmy's teaching on how to love better and with your whole heart. I hope you got a lot out of it. And if you want to see part two, which I know you do, make sure you come back next week and subscribe to this channel. We'll see you next time.